share my knowledge. Uh, I am Dr. Ramesh Sheen, a consultant urologist and robotic surgeon at Apollo Hospitals. And today the topic is quite vast, so there is a lot of uh, things we can talk, but because of the limitation of the time, let's talk about some common topics. Or, uh, I think the stone is one of the most common problems for urologists. So uh, let, let's talk about something about the stone first. The open operations for stone nowadays is literally given up. And the endoscopic treatment has emerged so much. I mean, no uh, minimally invasive surgeries like urethroscopy, RIRS, PCNO, and laparoscopy. So one of the biggest thing in PCNL is earlier on, about a few years back, we used to do PCNL with a whiteboard, this one. The, sheet is about 26 or 28. So the chances of bleeding is very high, especially due to the pseudo-anorism or IV crystallus. So this has changed in a big way by doing a mini PCNL. So mini PCNL is the first step. What we do is we use a smaller incision so that the bleeding complication is much less and uh, it has gone further down to no stent, no tubes and the risk of bleeding. So, what exactly is the mini PCNL? What we have done is remove, we remove, we have reduced the size of the incision or reduced the size of the sheet. So, this is an instrument which you use nowadays, and this is three times is small, medium to moderate. This is the instrument we use. So, what is the advantage of mini PCNL? Is first thing is it is smaller incision, so the bleeding uh, risk is much lower. And this is supine PCNO is another uh, play where if the patient has got a lot of comorbidities where the patient cannot be positioned in a prone position or COPD, where there is combined procedures required, then we go for supine PCNO, where the patient is positioned in a supine position. The advantage of supine PCNO is we can combine PCNO with urethroscopy. So that means the patient will be supine position and the PCNO to tackle the kidney stone, if there is any ureteric stone that can be tackled by ureteroscopy, which is semi-rigid or like RIRS. So the, what is the next step they moved is, a mini, I'm, frankly I don't have many, much experience with this. There are from mini PCN, ultra mini, mini PCNO. So basically what is the size of the sheath is being, getting reduced. So the, finally what is the smaller incision, less bleeding, and because of the mini PCNO, what we have achieved is we don't admit any of the patient nowadays. So PCNO can be done as a daycare. This is the biggest breakthrough now. And there's no tubes, no stents, there's no role for uh, forgotten stent or anything. But it has got a very limited scope. It is not indicated for complete stagon for this one. This is not indicated for complete stagon. Complete stagon is still a standard PCNO or a mini PCNO. So the main disadvantage is PCN. So basically how we are able to achieve this mini PCNO is because of the energy source what we use to break the stones. So earlier on we are using lithoclast. Now we do use, we largely use with, I mean we use lithoclast but not as much as we do before or we can combine it with an ultrasound. So basically the mini PCNO emerged because of laser. The laser is though it is, it can break any stone. That is the advantage of lasers but the disadvantage is it takes time. The, 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 uh, because we have reduced the size of the sheet, the fragments, removal of the fragment stone is a bit difficult with the mini PCO. So what we use is called just flushing. We use a, a, a water to flush it out through the stone fragments to come out through the sheet. Other, than, other thing is that the stenting difficulties. We can't pass a, because the instrument is small, it won't take a stent. So we'll have to have some difficult, but can be done. We have some modification for stenting. So the other one is RIRS. Again, this is the after the semi-rigid urethroscope, this is called flexible urethroscope. There's a lot of changes in this. The first one is um, now we've got a digital scope. Earlier on, this was not coming in a big way because of the limitation of the scope. The scope is very uh, fragile and uh, the number of uh, cases which you can use the scope was much less. Now with the digital, they said the life of the scope is much longer. So, Again, this is complemented by use of a laser and the access sheet where we can use up to one centimeter lower pole stone and easily tackle with our errors. And again, this is a very limited indication. This is a small stone and the risk of bleeding is less and again, it can be done on a supine position. So the laser in neurology, this is the one that makes the biggest change in stone management. 
So the one advantage of uh, laser is it's usually ideal for impacted stone where there is a bleeding is much less and the stone, with, with the, there is a laser doesn't leave a big fragments. It's usually, it's called, it's uh, vaporizers or it's fragments into minimal pieces. So you don't need to have a, what you call, grassware or a, a basket to remove the stone fragments. It's usually, it's just a vaporizer. So there is no need to worry about the fragments. So the chance of stone migration also less because there is no retropulsion. So that means you, the chance of migration is less, the damage to mucosa is less, and chances of perforation or false passage is much less. And it's an idea for a daycare procedures. I think now nobody, uh, most of the cases in uh, stone are done at a daycare. The, the, like, the latest novelty is the robotic surgery. So it's where there's a very combined this, uh, the computer technology with the laparoscopy technology. That is the way we, we call it the robotic technology. And can you have a, can you just press the play in this one? This is an ESI machine, and now we have the latest one. Okay, fine. It is. I think this is the, the machine, how it is docked to the other side. The, basically, what we do in a robotic is, what we do in a robotic is, instead of a surgeon holding the laparoscopic instrument, the robot is holding the instrument. It is all, and the movement is con completely controlled by the surgeon sound. So it's like a playing a video game. At the same time, the surgeon has a control of the camera. So you don't have to, you don't have a, uh, this one to shout at the surgeon, I hold that, this, that, camera, show me that, show me that. No, it's entirely under your control. So this is how the robotic theater is positioned, where the head end, the head is, is there. The surgeon sits on the console here, and the, the assistant stands on opposite side with the oh, view part. Next one. So this has got three components, the surgeon console, the patient card, and the vision card. The first one is a surgeon console where the patient sits there. The second one is a, is a patient card where the, the robotic arms are. So you can see the numbers are one, two, three. So the first two, we, we, can, we can change the arm. We can have three arms, basically. The one, the camera is number one, and the other two we can use for the holding, the retraction. Apart from that, this, we can have an extra number of ports where the assistant help you. And then the vision card, what is at the center, is where you have uh, the assistant sees the vision card and then helps you in the case. So this is how the, do you have a pointer? It's there, it's the other switch is pointer. This one? The front one, this one. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. You see, this, this is an instrument. This is what the makes the robo very costly. So basically, this is disposable. The one who invented the robo is a very clever guy. So what they did is that they made this one disposable. So this can be used only for 10 cases. So after that, the computer won't recognize it. So basically, that's where they make the money. It's a recurring uh, this one. So what happens is instead of the lab, this is a port that is going into the patient. So basically, this is an instrument to which the, the, this is a port, the instrument goes through this. We have similar like scissors, hold a grass first, Maryland, all the laparoscopic instruments are more or less the same. So what is the biggest difference in rubber is in the hand, we have a limitation of the movement. That is, here in rubber it's 360 degrees. So that is where the, the, we can hold this with the needle holder in any degree, forehand, backhand, whatever you want. So this is the range of movement explaining this front and back, up and down, sideways, and it's basically six degrees, seven degrees of movement. So this is how the surgeon does. Whatever he he holds this with this, with the thumb and index finger, and some people use a middle finger, and that movement is converted into the movement of the instrument step. So instead of surgeon holding the knife, it is an instrument that's holding the knife. That's what the progress. So the basically, Robo is, it's been about, uh, from 2000, it's been about 15 years, the Robo is in the market now. So there's an extended indications now, but basically the Robo came in a big way for the urology cases. So the first one to use was a prostate. And the second most commonly we use is partial nephrectomies and myeloplasties and the rest of the cases and BB fistulas and they like, these are other indications. As of now, the gold standard for localized prostate cancer is radical prostatectomy, for which the gold standard is robotics. So basically, 
eighty percent of the cases of prostatectomy is done by robot now. I mean, so what exactly is how is a prostate different from other surgery? Is instead of because we have the delicate nerves running by the side of the prostate. So basically, we need to preserve these nerves that supplies the sphincter as well as the cavernous center for directions. So basically, what we need is we need to get the prostate out along with the seminal vesicles. And the last thing is to join the anastomosis. The anastomosis have to be mucosa to mucosa. And to get a proper uh, continence, this is most important, especially in a male, in a male who has got a uh, smaller pelvis, narrow pelvis. The anastomosis is very difficult to achieve, was very difficult to achieve, I should say, in earlier days. So that is where the robo came in a big way. So the, the, today, as of now, the, uh, the gold standard is robotic prostatectomy. The, the why the robo came as a big way is easy with the dorsal vein ligation. That is, the bunch of veins lying behind the prostate, pubic bone. So, and second, once you get this dorsal vein ligation properly, the blood, the field becomes bloodless. And then the next step is to preserve the nerves and the dynastomosis. So these are the four important major steps in radical prostatectomy. So this is an incision we used to do earlier with open surgery where a lower midline incision. Now we use spinal steel more often. And this is how we do robotically. There is one small, this is a camera port. These are two a stern port and two, this is one 5 mm port and these are three uh, robotic ports. So this is a specimen of the robotic specimen. So what exactly is it? As I said, is a less blood loss because we're able to get the dorsal vein complex, which is a major source of bleeding in a, this one. Second, shorter hospital stay, faster recovery, and because of visualization. As with the robot, we see whatever is the 10 times visualization is there. So basically, it's we see much more clearer because less blood loss as well as enhancement as and surgical precisions. And early reports when they were, when they were, say, when they were marketing the robot, they were saying that the, these two are the major thing, reduce the risk of prostate enlargement and improve cancer control. In future slides, I will to say this is nowadays the robot and the open and the robotics, the results are being more or less the same. Let's come to that later. So, but, but why the robot, we were able to sell robot in a better, this one was this. They said initially the reports that the fast margin positive and the cancer control were much better with the robot. And the early return of continence and complete uh, recovery of sexual function was the earlier point. And this is a video. I think we don't have much time. So if you want, I can show you at the end. So why was this prostate surgery? If you look at the history of prostate surgery, it was it, only in late 70s and 80s this came up in a big way because earlier on the uh, prostate surgery is seen as a big evil because of the risk of incontinence and losing erections. So this was completely changed by Walsh uh, robotic, pro, pro, sorry, Walsh open prostatectomy. So the main risk was incontinence and losing erection. So now we have the solution for both. So this is what we call it as uh, advanced male state. This is similar to what we, basically we wait for one, uh, one year. There is about 10% risk of incontinence uh, after one year. So there is about 20% in immediate post-op period, but it regularly reduces and the risk is around standard around 10% after one year. So we, we don't do anything till one year. And if the, con if the cancer clearance is good, then they go for incontinence procedures. So this is called advanced male sling, where in, like similar to that, we in the females, so what this is a this is where you make an operator for us. We make a small incision and take a small tape. This is a bulbar urethra. So the basic purpose of this tape is to compress these two, the squat, the anterior posterior wall, and the the bulbar urethra. So basically, this is like a mesh which compresses this one. This was a, uh, was uh, promoted as a alternative to sphincter because the sphincter is much more expensive. But the problem with this is how to get, how much it's too tight, the patient may not be able to pass through it. If it's too loose, it doesn't serve the function. So basically now the modification is, what they do is instead they, instead of a mesh here, there is a special, um, uh, what do you call, there is a, like a, a 
a solution where you can add, keep adding. That is, the port is there. It's that, so we make a small port here, just connected to the tubing, and then it is like a small sheet here, which we keep adding fluids to this. It's called atom nowadays. It's been sold nowadays in the last few years. So it's been marketed. So what they do is instead of a mesh here, we just it is like a, something like a fluid filled uh, like sac. So we keep adding fluid to it. So it keeps. So we can first start with minimal, and then if the patient is still continuing to add a little bit fluid to that, so that's what. This is basically is a modification of ACT balloons. The earlier on, when this came, they were using balloons to place in the bladder neck area and used to fill the balloon with uh, saline, with a cutaneous port. So that the balloons were not approximating properly. That's why they were using this thing. Of course, this is how it looks. So basically, from the other. Uh, Right. And this is a gold standard. This artificial urinary sphincter is a gold standard. And this is the cost about is expensive. It costs about six lakhs. So, but there are some people who do prefer this, especially young patients who have this one. But the life is about ten years, and it's much more easier to use. I myself have done few cases here. There are three or four patients who are very extremely happy with this. But the cost comes with the cost. Then the other one is impotence. So basically, the other worry about prostatectomy surgery is losing uh, losing erections. So basically, losing erections. Nowadays, what we do is the basically the the erection depends upon what is the age of the patient and what was his erection status before surgery. So what we do is, if somebody is young who want to preserve the sexual function, we immediately put them on postoperatively put them on small dose of PDE5. So they keep the blood flow of this one, but we wait for some time. If they, if they can't able to achieve an erection, then they have other options. The options are implants, which can be uh, semi-rigid or inflatable. These are inflatable devices. These are the gold standard. But again, this comes with a cost for the five lakhs implant. But these we this one for younger people who are much younger and older people, they can go for semi-rigid implants. Both of them can be done as. Uh, uh, rigid implants can be done as a daycare. So the next area where we use robo very often is partial nephrectomy. So the partial nephrectomy is where, where you, the, the gold standard today is in treatment of renal tumor is partial nephrectomy unless there is a contraindication to it. So we never, earlier on we used to do radical nephrectomy which is gone now. So the basic indications, is, these are the basic indications, bilateral tumor, single tumor, renal insufficiency. But we, though we, these are the indications, any patients who come with a renal tumor, the first suggestion to them will be partial nephrectomy. The reason being, nowadays most of the uh, tumors are diagnosed uh, asymptomatic by routine scans, so we see them much earlier. So this is how we do, we just clamp the vessels, and once we clamp the vessels, we go in for an effect, partial nephrectomy. This can also be done by laparoscopically. This is a robotic advantage because of the vision, we are able to close the collecting system much better. This is one of the case, first case we did. So this is uh, how we do open and is converted to that uh, as a partial nephrectomy. This is a specimen. So this is how it looks. We have one port, this will be the camera port, these are two ports and this is how the specimen comes out. And this is a case where there is a tumor is invaded the, the renal vein. We just did robotically, and this is a renal vein tumor we can see. The other area where the robot is extensively used is the vesicovaginal fistula, especially those uh, failed cases. The robot has got much better advantage. And then partial nephrectomy. I myself have done about two partial nephrectomies where we use this is a girl with a 14 years old bilateral fio. You see that the tumor is so aggressive and. This is one of the normal limbs. So what we did is we did a partial nephrectomy preserving that limb. She's still fine. And this is another guy who had a previous nephrectomy done and solitary kidney with tumor death. So these are the cases where we did partial nephrectomies. So what exactly is the people think it's uh, robot is much expensive and needs training and about the safety. Regarding the cost, so where what happens is the initial cost is compensated by the early mobility. The patient can go to the work quicker and the pain and all these things are much, but still we are much cheaper than compared to the West which is about $6,000-$7,000 which is $35,000 in US and abroad in the first world. Of course we need training, there is a, those who have extensive open or laparoscopic training, 
getting into the robo and start to work is much easier. The only thing in robo is you have to scale the movement because we don't have a tactile sensation. That is the biggest thing. I, I got trained in the US for a few days and I have done about more than 100 cases. Nowadays, every patient in your room comes and asks how many cases you have done. So we, I normally show them by myself and make a decision. There are people who say they have done 1,000, 200. But actually, after 25 cases, it's a routine, whatever you do. So, and then safety, we, we have done 2,000 cases. We never had any breakdown or morbidity or mortality. So, last one, so sorry for the taking few minutes. So, at all this, please don't take a message that robotic is a gold standard. It is not. It is, depends on the availability. So, basically what happens is, is still the, the standard of treatment is low-case prostate cancer is radioprostatectomy. This can be achieved by open prostatectomy. The reason now we have a better retractors now, better lighting system, it can be done the same. The results can be, oncology results can be achieved by open at 50% of the cost. So we do about, I myself do about 4 or 5 open prostate in a year. The cost is about 50% and now with the advent of beta anesthesia techniques, we do under spinal. We do under spinal morphine. The patient is absolutely painless, stays in hospital for 2 days and goes home on the third day of walking. So basically open is equally good and there are a lot of literatures in especially in uh, countries like Australia and New Zealand where, the, where I got trained we used to do three or four open radical prostatectomy in a week, in a week. So basically there the papers have come showing that results are up similar to that of a robotic which is mainly in US. So basically I think we'll have to follow the both. That if the patient is affordable, go for robotic. If it is not, go for a open. It's equally good. Similar, same thing with, uh, with uh, tumor, renal tumors. If the patient is affordable, yes, go for a robotic. If not, go for a simple open because we have epidural anesthesia to take care of all this thing, but the morbidity persists. And then the other thing, I think the other thing, most common reason is where the use is now is uh, uh, the prostate for the benign case, for the, 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 the clear indication for uh, laser prostatectomy is a large prostate as the studies have shown only equivalent they are much better to open prostatectomy. They have not compared the size. If you look at the size of the laser prostate, the papers have come. They are all 300, 400 grams, which in my private practice, I have not seen more than 150 grams so far. So I don't see where is the indication for this one. The specific indication is those who have stents where the uh, anticoagulants cannot be stopped or where the storage is not available. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks. So robotic prostomy how do you approach through the cystoscopy? What is the approach? How do you get No, we have a similar laparoscopic port. We put a one umbilical, that's a camera port. And we have this one. Instead of laparoscopic instrument, the robotic port. That's all. Through the abdomen? Yes. What are the cost of production? That's the approach. Average, average cost? I think it's 10. 10. MC. MC and then annual maintenance is about one and then the instrument is a killer there. Yeah. So now the each now we have we have S X I, now we, uh, this is S I, now we have this called X I, the latest one. The so what they do is once you move on to the next, the earlier instrument you can't use. <laughs> so basically you have to buy a newer one. So that is why they're making killer in uh, this one. So each uh, uh, instrument can be used only ten times and there's a cost of the US uh, dollar value. Just switch on, switch off the robo with the minimal instruments, it comes to about 1.5 to 1.6. So, but you, you say you have equally good results with open prostate. Yeah. Then what is, what is the indication? It's a marketing value, sir. It's as simple as that. It's out there. You as they are marketing. No, no. As what is your real indication no. for robotic? No, no, no. My indication is simple. The oncology clearance is the patient need radical prostate activity. That is all. The earlier on, radical prostate activity people were not attempting to do open because the simple reason of incontinence if you like. Now with the, 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 the book pointer retractor, with a better this one, little older, we can able to achieve the so same results. So when do you use there open? Is no, no. Even the affordability, the patient wants uh, this one, but patient wants it. Patient, the most of the patient, they come and they want it, that's all. But anastomosis is better. But long term results, I mean, I have not done many new but I have done about 25 people in prostate care. Yeah, so they have results are good. But the cost of amount of money you put in to get that result is controversial. Earlier on, there is to say we have a better result. 
in terms of early results. But now with people who doing still, uh, the, in, I mean, even in public system in some of the countries, the robo is not there. But in US, it's mostly it is the insurance uh, driven mechanism. So the, every hospital has a robo. Every, everybody is become as a competitor. If the other guy has a robo, then he has to, he's forced to buy it. So he's forced to use it. So now he's selling it better. But it is not being sold well in Europe or in, in Australasia. It is, a, it is a luxury to the surgeon. I feel it is a much better. If I am operating in a robot, I feel much more this one because of the ease of operation. And the laparoscopically, the person, the surgeon has to be skilled to do the laparoscopic sutures. But in robotic, it is easily written. You can do, I can do, even he can do, he can do. But in laparoscopy, it is not. Out of the 10, only few has the intrinsic uh, the skills to do it. That is what reproducibility is better with robot. Yeah. Of, of, of course, with certain training. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Prabhavati, please come right on to hand over the certificate of the So what I am saying is, the message is, that is not, though they say it's a gold standard, I think it is all based on the availability of the healthcare system. So if you have the money and if you have the insurance, of course this robo insurance is not paying. So the basic problem is, we are finding it difficult to convince a patient to prescribe. But there are many patients, many, uh, this one who go for a palliative treatment like anti-androgen, the norkinectomy, which is not acceptable. So basically, even in 2000 when I went to UK, there are only 10 surgeons in the entire UK were able to do radical prostatectomy. So that is why the situation. 